Hi, my name is Ronnie Pironic, Global CFO and co-owner of Worldwide Oilfield Machine, or WOM, or even WOM. WOM is a leader in onshore technologies and also in subsea production and intervention systems, including capping stacks, gate valve shearing technology, and subsea HPUs. We have gone beyond depths of 9,600 feet and serviced over 900 offshore wells around the world. It is a pleasure to be a part of the subsea community and to this event. Whether you are a customer, vendor, employee, or part of the community, over the last 41 years, WAM's primary focus is on designing technology innovation solutions for the oil and gas industry, complemented by robust, vertically integrated, and patented manufacturing capabilities and testing facilities. The question that drives our manufacturing processes and design solutions is, how can we make the next life better? The motivation is to be resilient, stable, and steady to make the next life better. Now, with this philosophy in mind, and to make this impact, how many of us would agree that it would really help if our industry was predictable and steady? We all know, not only is it just cyclical and embedded in geopolitics, but technologies introduced have continuously developed and disrupted what was once known. After 2015, we all experienced a decline in the industry, and with budgets either waiting or tightening, the more capex-intensive, almost most advanced sector of our industry, offshore or subsea, saw one of the first deeper and long-term cuts. Then in 2020, the onset of COVID needs no storyline to reiterate, but the impact was the highest rise of companies either dissolving or being merged and restructured with larger participants. Even in 2021, we've seen a rise of up to 158% in M&As since the 1980s. Now, how does an industry, an advanced industry, one that even pre-COVID has provided 25 to 30% of the world's energy needs, dig its heels and steady on forward in the midst of uncertainties. How about we start with what we do know? In the words of time-tested wisdom, we can control what we do know. My talk today is the five C's to resilience and not sub-sea C's as in the oceans. <laughs> Sorry, I had to just say that. But the letter C. I grew up in the oil and gas industry. My father, Sudhir, or Sam Pironic, started WOM when I was four years old as a gate valve manufacturer. My mom and I would bring him dinner at his small shop garage across the Dairy Queen at night here in Houston, Texas, where he spent hours developing and refining his patented integrated hard facing for gates and seats far superior than the HVOF process. As a metallurgist, it was common to hear words from him like stable state diffusion and biometallic structural bonds. Finding solutions for the customer at a fair cost was key. Now, the way I've seen it, at the end, the true customer is you and I. As the industry finds cleaner, responsible, safer, and cheaper ways to bring energy, oil, and gas to use, it eventually is impacting your and my homes, families, communities, and pockets to save more so we can make ours and the next life better. What I bring to you are my observations as a multinational company that has participated to supply and fulfill demands of domestic and global energy needs. Beyond consumer and cost, there are more participants that influence our ability to be resilient. And I call them the five C's to resilience. At the end, this is an interconnected web of supply and demand for energy and petroleum products of a growing world population. Sure, we see extensions of vocabulary, right, which includes renewables and transitionals, but change is not new to us. We've adapted, developed, pivoted, and partnered change since 1859. In one aspect, I'd even say we are ahead of the energy game. And the winners will be those who understand what to expect and how to evolve. 
I remember the 1980s when I was a teenager. Talk around the dinner table was how our business was shifting. The business, valves and manifolds that once supplied to the U.S. domestic market as a source for its energy needs was gradually shifting overseas. Transportation became a huge part of the supply chain and affected everything from procurement of raw materials, planning and promised delivery dates. One day of delay or lost time could cost the offshore rig anywhere up to $250,000 to $500,000 a day. Here I introduce the first C, customer-centric solutions. Fit for purpose, meaningful, measurable. The industry was progressing from shallow water to deep sea. HPHT, high pressure, high temperature, was being challenged and pushed with each discovery of deeper subsea oil plays. When WAM ventured into subsea with a footprint in Aberdeen, Scotland in 1989, that explained how he and his team were developing a lightweight, smaller volume, compact intervention system with industry-changing gate valve technology to shear coil tubing and seal the well bore. This was applauded by contractors who utilized smaller vessels, saved on cost to take equipment offshore, and was easier to handle, safer, and offered a quality product with less operational downtime. Today, the traditional customers may seem to be on a pause. But as we saw in this symposium, development has not stopped. Technology continues to advance. And yes, we are seeing a shift in the customer pool and who they are partnering. So I recently read, uh, according to the S&P Global Platts in July of this year, South Korea's shipbuilders saw a 13-year high in new orders winning mostly for LNG carriers, container ships, and very large crude carriers. Larger players from Asian countries like India are entering the mix and on the rise. According to Upstream Energy, India's government-owned ONGC, the Oil and Natural Gas Corporation, has laid down plans for a phased tendering for as many as five key offshore EPC projects, totaling $1.25 billion. Low-cost countries, which were once used only to outsource cheaper manpower, are now beginning to develop. They are developing expertise and experience in the offshore sector. And to that, the financial hit from the industry downturn and COVID has me introduce the second C to being resilient, cost consciousness. Costs of production and costs of energy are being revisited. From exploration to conversion, production to transportation, there's a magnifying glass on every single penny. Now, cheaper is not always better, but smarter technologies and strategies to get a fair price are definitely searched for. Capital spend has been replaced greatly by lease and rental agreements. Five-year certifications are still valid, but only if rigs haven't been scrapped, recycled, or repurposed by then. Digital tech, which reduces manpower burden, is strongly sought after. The motivator and challenge is to find ways to make a profit at $50 a barrel, now maybe $70 a barrel. How to lower costs to explore, produce, transport, and utilize. And then, in April of 2020, we saw the effects of speculative futures cap out, plummeting oil to negative numbers. I mean, I still remember that morning when I thought something was wrong with my phone app, like negative oil prices. With the interlaced interdependencies of the oil and gas industry, the entire world, it's like it went on a holding pattern except for one thing, an instinct for survival. And survival depends on cost. Going back a little further, a little further behind, since the 1990s, I've seen the effects of companies leaning on low-cost countries to maintain or increase profits by reducing their cost of production. WAM did the same and began strategies for vertical integration, not just being cost-conscious, 
but having an aim to be cost independent or financially independent. Let's take a look at BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. BRICS, or BRICS, contributed to 67% total increase of energy consumption since 2000. Now, yes, though COVID put a small break on the development of countries like China and India, China's Q2 2021 GDP grew at 7.9% and India grew at 9.6%. This just gives us a sense of the volume of growth the energy sector will be needed for. The U.S., which once imported oil and gas, is now the leading producer in the world. But before this achievement, when U.S. was importing oil, goods, and services, it was paying low-cost countries using a strong currency, the dollar. So, developing countries were able to tap into the purchasing power of the dollar for their own development, with an aim to becoming cost or financially independent. In the process, countries like China and India have been building resiliency a little bit at a time over the past 20, 25 years. Smart sourcing and technology development is no longer a strategy for developed countries, but developing countries are adopting similar trends, building critical resources internally and outsourcing non-critical. For the U.S. market, yes, hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling, it has changed the industry, making reservoirs accessible with lower costs to drill and produce than offshore. But now, and going into the future, innovation cannot just advance the limits of technology, but it must be partnered with cost consciousness and cost independence as well. Without a doubt, the world is getting smaller and more aware. And this awareness is giving rise to the third C to resilience, which is care, simply care. Our industry is one of, if not the most visibly regulated for safety, health, and environment. Room for air tightens each day. Safety for workers, especially offshore, is top priority and a non-negotiable with one of the highest liability and risk insurance coverages. Health impacts to workers, communities, and environment caused by offshore operations, well, they meet headlines and are up for discussions. Environment concerns go beyond just carbon emissions, and they consider now ocean life, disposable plans of equipment, recycling, conversion, and most importantly, doing each activity in the cleanest manner possible. What I see is that each country is forming a set of cultural tolerances to determine where and how to source energy. Oil and gas equipment must continuously keep up with further additions of API standards of quality and safety or CE marking mandates on steel sources by European countries. And each country will be held to international standards of humanitarian ethics. Care also entails cultural awareness. Diversity and inclusion are on the forefront of our workforce. The impact of energy production, issues, and utility are visible and vocal across daily lives of all populations. Everyone who uses energy or petroleum products cares about how it's sourced, what measures the industry takes to prevent harm, provide fairly, manufacture, and transport responsibly. In order to attract the next gen of workforce to our industry, how we show up to care will be considered and valued. We as an industry already invest heavily to develop and design responsible technologies, remote automated processes. We use sensors to prevent emergencies, to protect people and the environment. Like any industry, we too have hazards and accidents, which definitely and rightfully cause an emotional appeal. But the billions of dollars spent, thousands of hours volunteered, and multifaceted efforts to ensure corrective and preventive actions should equally be spoken about. There's a reason why offshore 
in the U.S. and internationally is a highly regulated and safety-focused industry. And this third C, care, will always be the center of considerations as we withstand changes and evolve. This brings me to the fourth C to resilience, communication channels. In light of the global pandemic, couldn't we say a whole new dimension has come to impact data access? Granted, the big data shift started around 2007 with digital transformation, big data, information, and cross-border connectivity. However, not all countries played on the same level field since their technology infrastructure and capabilities had not been fully developed. But during COVID, countries that were behind, they had to shift gears to the digital world where remote tracking and touchless connectivity became available to all. What would have taken another five to 10 years happened in just a few months. Today, information is more traceable, it's live, and this brings more visibility to areas of improvement and productivity. And that increases demand for stronger performance, exceeding expectations, getting things done faster, better, safer, cleaner, cheaper. Tech in this field of big data programs, it's growing like never before. For example, India is now investing over $15 billion in mapping and geospatial business to bring communication transparency and data and information for logistics, transportation, and tracking. Today, the race is for industry participants to meet net zero carbon goals. We hear about it all the time. Carbon accounting platforms need to be accurate instead of rough activity data. Data channels and how it translates or is communicated will be critical to justifying efforts towards reduction of carbon goals. Data dependency, it's for real. Carbon is showing up as the new currency. It recently traded at 50 euros per metric ton on the EU emissions trading system. But let me change gears a bit. There's one more communication channel not many of us speak about. It's connecting with our next generation. Subsea, offshore, it's a mystery to many of the next gen and the decline in skilled talent is proof of it. Somehow it's not being attractive or maybe just not understood. We all know oil and gas is a technology-driven industry and always will be. Whether we develop renewables, like floating platforms for wind or use solar power for accommodation units on a rig, or use acoustics to send digital information from subsea to the seabed to eliminate the web of umbilicals. It's all about innovating technology and integrating a variety of advancements to optimize operations, cost, quality, and safety. Talking about connecting with the next gen, China has put in millions to send over 600,000 students per year to the U.S. to get a formal education in STEM, and it has an aggressive English-speaking program. Communication channels are the conduit to connecting the world for transparency and efficiency in logistics, data transfer and utility, and sheer knowledge. Through communication and exchange of meaningful information, as leaders, we can make uncertain times feel certain again. And what better way to bridge gaps than to focus on creative collaborations, the fifth and final C to resilience. Now with connectivity at the forefront, information equity allows transparency and trust. With Industry 4.0 making its push in the energy sector, smarter machines, equipment, transportation services, they can predict failures, predetermine fixes, and AI can provide solution options to increase profits and monitor tolerances. Now, imagine the day when a smart rig is producing in the Gulf of Mexico and it's constructed with data points and automatic analytics tied back to its suppliers. So when it predicts a problem, smart machines contact the supplier of equipment or service, create a purchase order which automatically signals a demand for a job order with the supplier to get into production before it even knows it. No downtime, data flows seamlessly, it's meaningful, 
and integrated. But we're not done, <laughs> there's more. Then it becomes a highly complex yet automatic project planning machine for thousands of data points to coordinate parts, research, service techs, transport options, gets the best price given the regulation requirements, quality and lead time to deliver and install, communicates ETA to the customer, and all while simultaneously refreshing minimum stock quantities for the supplier for the next such predictive event. What a dream. <laughs> The point is, oil and gas is seeing a rise in skill and technology overlaps from all industries. And it's keeping all five C's in mind. Solutions are customer-centric, cost-conscious, care is built in, communication channels provide data exchange platforms, and creative collaborations become an integrated give and take to evolve and adapt with the changes and uncertainties in our industry. We see companies like Neptune using gaming tech for training, keeping the tech safe and enhancing their knowledge. 3D metal printing is being developed to lower costs of prototyping and testing on otherwise what could have been costly trials. A slew of sensors and measuring tags are deployed for data mining. Robotics are being advanced each day. Even WAM is using a gate valve technology to shear and seal coil tubing for sub-C, replacing the traditional heavier BOP technology as a safety head device. Control systems are becoming more sophisticated with acoustic technologies and moving the HPU to the seabed. Wow, talk about creative collaborations, right? The CEO of Oceaneering, Rod Larson, uh, recently in an interview he said, it's not good enough to be first. You have to get the story right. So through my journey so far, I've observed that the five main leads of this oil and gas offshore story are consumer, cost, care, communication, and collaboration. The five C's to resilience. Because resilience equals stability in the midst of any uncertainty. And these five C's give us an anchor or stability of what we know. And stability, it gives us the resolve to evolve and adapt, keeping fundamentals intact. Resilience equals stability, and stability enables you, empowers you, to make your and the next life better. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>